Hey, thanks for joining us uh, here at Door Creek Church Online. Happy Mother's Day. Wherever you find yourself this Mother's Day weekend, let's worship together. Arise, my soul, remember this. He took my sin. Mother's Day, everyone. Wherever you're streaming from today, thank you for joining us at Door Creek Church Online. Be sure to stay connected with us through social media and our digital bulletin, doorcreek.info. Here you'll find a place to take message notes, see what's happening, give, and connect with us, especially if you have questions. The Connect tab on the digital bulletin is also a great place to share prayer requests or to reach out to our team. During these present circumstances, there are many different types of needs. The Connect card is a simple way for you to get in touch with us so we can pray for you and come alongside you during these trying times. Again, that's doorcreek.info and at the very bottom is the Connect tab. Now let's continue our service as we worship together through music and listen as our lead pastor, Mark Myfair, continues our series, Now What? So wherever you are right now, let's sing together. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter, that God in his great mercy gave us a new birth into a living hope through resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
no matter what this world throws at us, we can cling to that hope. If God gave us the greatest gift of all, what more would he not give us? We cling to that hope even in this season. Let's sing this together. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls. Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me.
Well, happy Mother's Day and welcome again to Door Creek Church Online. We're glad that you're streaming us wherever you're streaming us from. And as we celebrate Mother's Day today, we know that we're probably going to be celebrating it uh, differently than maybe we have in the past. And just on that note, for those that uh, this may be a very difficult day for, uh, maybe you're grieving the loss of a mom in your life or perhaps you're grieving the loss of a child, Uh, or you're waiting to even have that child to be the mom that you want to be. We just want to remind you that Christ is our living hope as we've just sung and that there's faithful women here in this church who have walked that journey. We would hate for you to walk it alone. Please reach out to us. We'd love to come alongside you. But we've reached out to other women in our church, moms, and have just asked (laughs) <laughs> just asked, what is motherhood? Uh, what are your favorite memories about your mom? We even asked some little kiddos. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and watch that together. So we just celebrate the moms in our life. Something special I'd like to say to my mom is that she's the best mom I would ever have. When I think of my mother, the word that comes to mind is rock. I remember as a mom, I always prayed with our boys that if they did something wrong, that they'd get caught. I didn't want them to get into a habit pattern and thinking they could get away with it. My mom is loving and creative, and as the years go by, she continues to imagine and dream of new ways that the family can get together. Um, A few summers ago, my mom hosted Camp Shenanigans, where all the kids came and just had a really fun time doing obstacles and challenges. And I just really appreciated the time and the energy she put into that so that our family could have those memories. She was a rock for so many people who came to her for different reasons and leaned on her and she was always there. My mom was a loving encourager. Uh, Even when I was like five or six and I wanted to learn to water ski, she was my encourager. I was doing homeschooling and I needed help on reading and I was calling her and then she came. When we were running a 5k and she told me to keep on going. When her oldest sister, my aunt, turned 100, we traveled to Louisiana to celebrate. We couldn't get to sleep. We stayed in the same room in the same bed and we just stayed up all night practically laughing and talking and laughing. But she also realized that there was a balance between being my advocate and making me responsible for my own actions. When I was 12 years old and I had the measles, my mother sat by my bedside the entire night. I was quite sick. Just waking up throughout the night, she was there and her presence was just so comforting to me. Mom is always there for me for every high, every low, every in-between. For all of you moms out there, I would just encourage you to never underestimate the influence that you have in your children's lives. I just pray that we can only use that to God's glory. Enjoy your kids, enjoy them. This uh, situation that we're in right now is temporary. We're all struggling a little bit, struggling with different things. God created us for these families and put us with these families, um, knowing that we are what they need. Care for yourself and give yourself grace. And remember they go through different stages of life. Enjoy each stage that they are in, the good times and the hard times, because that too shall pass and they'll be on to another stage. You don't have to be perfect. Ask God for guidance. Take out as much time and opportunity to make and create precious memories that will resonate with your children for a lifetime. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us online today. My name's Mark, one of the pastors, and a huge shout out to all of you who have been part of helping us feed lots and lots of families, hundreds of families, over 450 families in these last eight weeks through Fill the Van. 
and another 600 families in Rwanda through our partners World Relief there and purchasing seeds so they can plant crops to feed their families in the upcoming months as well. And in two weeks, you guys, we're starting a new partnership with Compassion International in the country of Honduras, and we'll be connecting with hundreds of more families as we sponsor kids. Stay tuned to that. So I just wanted to give a huge shout out to Amina, one of the moms of our church. She's a teacher at our partner school, Mendota Elementary, but she and Matt and her kids live right next to Sandberg Elementary. Mendota has a food pantry, and we've been connecting with them. Sandberg did not have a food pantry, and so through Phil the Van, six weeks ago, we helped Jimena open up the food first food pantry for Sandberg right in her garage. And from 12 families six weeks ago to over 100 families now, week in, week out, Jimena and others with her are helping feed a bunch of families. So shout out to you, Jimena. It's so awesome. Thanks for excelling in the grace of giving. Thanks for extending Christ's compassion to people in need. Thanks for living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We are so proud of you and celebrate with you. It's so good to be part of a church that wants to be a Christ-centered church for all people. Hey, on this Mother's Day weekend, I wanna just pray thanking God for our mothers. Would you join me? Father, I thank you for my mom, with her huge heart for you, for us kids. I thank you for the things that she taught me. And Lord, we just bless you for our mothers who brought us into this world and gave us life who taught us how to live and to love, for grandmothers who did the same, for their merciful, generous, caring hearts, for moms who pointed us to you. We thank you for them. And we pray for our moms today and all the challenges that they're facing for extra grace and strength and a sense of peace and calm and the ability to smile at the future. And the Lord, we'd be remiss if we didn't pray for those who just long to be a mom today. And for whatever reason, Lord, it's not happened yet. And so we pray that they would sense that you are close to the brokenhearted and that you'd fill them with your comfort and with your hope. As we gather around your word, we don't want us to hear it. We want to do it to the end that we love you with all of our heart and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us in these ways, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So how are you guys doing with COVID-19 now, nine weeks in, nine weeks in? We've been experiencing a lot of losses. I'm calling them the COVID takeaways, the things that COVID-19 is actually taking away from us, like, like income, right? So some of us have been furloughed. There's been reduction of hours. Our commissions have been truncated. Our retirements are, are shriveling, right? They're shrinking. We've, we've lost a job. We're part of the 20 million people who filed for unemployment last month, over 25% in our state alone. COVID's taken away our schools. Kids are saying, mom and dad, I love you. And I thought homeschool was pretty cool, but I'm ready to go back to school, right? It's taken away those things. Our cherished times of interaction with grandparents or with our grandkids, right? Longing just to hold them and to hug them. It's taken away the milestone celebrations that we love to do together. I mean, just look at this picture of this wedding in an empty church with a couple people, a bride and a groom, an officiant, a couple witnesses. Oh man, we, we, we long to be together at a funeral, not just two or three family members around an open grave. We long to be part of the throng that's throwing our caps up in the air, celebrating our graduation. And so graduates, we celebrate you. You guys have been awesome. And what a stinky hard time. But you're gonna get through it and God's got great plans for you. And we're cheering you on. There's these takeaways, like our favorite pastime, going to Miller Park, or just going around to the neighborhood park, right? Oh man, how we're we missing gathering together on the weekends. This is awesome, but I miss you guys. We miss each other gathering in the chapel, gathering up into forest on the north side, right? At the auditorium at our Sprecher Road campus. So many takeaways. It's taken away our connections 
from our friends at work, down the street, the club. Loneliness is creeping in. The extroverts among us are freaking out, just longing for some face-to-face interaction that's not six feet apart. It's taken away the structure and routines. How many times in the last nine weeks have you said, what day is it? Because it's so confusing, like it's just all mushing together. Every day is every day, because they all seem to be the same. It's taken away our sense of safety and security, our sense of control, our sense of self-control, if we're honest. It's taken away our health. For some, a, a loss of smell or taste or the inability to receive care. We, we needed it, but we were afraid to go in. We, we need the rehab, but we can't go in. And so now our husband's given us rehab, or our parents given us rehab, and our bodies are breaking down, and worse, people are dying. This week we marked 75,000 just in our country alone. And that's just the stuff of coronavirus. There's been other losses. They have nothing to do with coronavirus. But these lost dreams and these deep hurts are impacting us tremendously. And the question today is when God takes away, what do we do? Now what? And we're going to look at the story of Job. Because when it comes to losses, there isn't anybody other than than Job that, that matches the kind of excruciating losses that he had. And, and he was this great man who we find out didn't deserve any of this. So grab your Bibles. We're in the book of Job. It's in the middle of your Bible just before the book of Psalms. And in this book, we just read about his stellar character, this family man, his great wealth, and his unbelievable devotion and piety towards God, which was not occasional, but was habitual. Look in verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That was his character. He had seven sons and three daughters, his family, and here's his wealth. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. This is Bill and Melinda Gates kind of wealth we're talking about. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was the goat, the greatest of all time. His sons used to hold feasts, verse 4, in their homes on their birthdays, and they'd invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So this just spectacular character, unbelievable wealth, right? Love for his family, devotion to God, his piety, which was just part of his everyday life. You go to chapter 29, you see he's this righteous man that cares for the vulnerable. He's this great man, the greatest, God says, that's walking the face of the earth. Enter the courtroom in heaven, verse 6 through 12. God seated on the throne. The angels are coming in to report, and in slips Satan, the Satan, the accuser, is what his name means. And it's as if we're, we're jumping into a conversation that they've already had, because God says to Job, so did you check him out? Did you check out Job, this man who is righteous and blameless and, and shuns evil and fears me, going through his, his just unbelievable stellar character? Have you checked him out? And, and Satan says, oh, yeah, I have. But it's pretty plain to see, God. You put a hedge around him, and you just keep pouring all this blessing on him. You take the hedge away, you take the blessing away, and you watch what happens. I'll bet he curses you to your face. God says, deal, bets on with this condition. Don't touch his body. So in verses 13 through 19, Satan begins to take away to test his theory, to see if it won't be true, to see if he can win the wager. The, 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 first, the first takeaway is through the Sabaeans, verse 15. Messenger comes in, said the Sabaeans have attacked. They've stolen all the donkeys and the oxen. Then a second, right on the heel, says, there's been a fire for heaven, from heaven. It's burned up the sheep and the shepherds. A third comes in, says the Chaldeans and their raiding parties have come in. All three of the raiding parties, they've 
taken all the camels and killed all the servants. And then the coup de grace comes the fourth servant with this news in verse 18 and 19. A mighty wind has swept in. The house has collapsed. It was covering your, your daughters and your sons and their spouses. And they're all gone. You've lost it all. All of it. And we read his response in verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name, the character of the Lord be praised, be worshiped. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Well, there's more. Because chapter 2 goes back to a similar kind of courtroom scene. And God says, so what about Job? Like, pay up. Because he's being true to me, isn't he? And, and this is what Satan says in verse 4. Skin for skin, let me touch him. A man will give all he has for his own life. God says, all right, you can touch him. Only don't take his life. He touches him. And he's afflicted with these sores all over his body. And the camera zooms in and we see him just hunker down, stooping, and his shoulders shrugged. And he's got a piece of broken pottery and he's scraping away at these sores that are oozing. And it's just this pitiful picture of this man who was the man before God and his people, and now it's just pitiful. He's lost it all, his wealth, his reputation, and we'll see here even the support of his friends, his wife, who says to him, Job, end the suffering for yourself and for me. Curse God and die. Job says, shall we not accept both good and trouble from God's hand? And verse 10 says, and this too, he did not sin against God. His three friends show up. They barely recognize him. For seven days, they sit in silence with him. And then after seven days, chapter three, the silence is broken and it's Job. This man who was blameless and upright, who didn't do anything to deserve all that had happened to his life. So he knows nothing about the wager in heaven. And God doesn't show him, hey, let me just show you how this is going to end. When I give it to you all two times back and even more. And you're going to live 140 years after this is all done. So just take heart. He doesn't know any of that. He doesn't know why this is happening. He doesn't know where it's going. That's just like us. Just like us. And this man who was blameless and upright, who shunned evil, who feared God. Well, now all of a sudden, he enters into the trial of his life. And there will be things that he takes back that go right back to this part. And here's where he starts. In the midst of his grief, huh? after deny, you know what comes after loss, right? It's anger. Oh, man, he's angry. He's angry over the day he was born, wished it never happened. He wished that he'd been born a stillborn. In verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3, he's wishing that he were dead. He's got these suicidal thoughts. He wants it all to end. And so from this point on, from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 37, you have these speeches, three cycles of speeches from his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And his three friends have this worldview. God rewards the righteous with blessing. The Bible talks about that. And so in their mind, their conclusion is, you're not being rewarded. You're getting hammered. And the reason you are, Job, is because you deserve it. You've sinned. So confess that. Own up to it. Repent of it. And, and, and be healed. We're just trying to help you out. And so it just goes on and on. They're pointing, defending God's justice, pointing out his sin, kind of coming up with what he might have done that brought it on. And he continues to hold on to his integrity and say, I'm innocent. God, help me out. God, where are you? And so there's this huge wrestling match that goes on with God. In chapter 7, verse 20, he says to God, if I sin, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do. Why have you made me your target? You've painted a target on my back. You're killing me, God. Have I become a burden to you? So he longs for 
a go-between. Because he, he's, he's not getting an audience with God. Well, well, can I get an umpire? Can I get a, an advocate to go between me and God so I can argue my case before God? Because that's what he wants to do. Chapter 13, verse 3. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. So Job prospered. And then, man, did he get hammered. And he suffers. But through it all, this book isn't just about the sufferings of a righteous person. It's about his perseverance. How do we know that? Because there's a cliff notes on the book of Job in the New Testament. And the New Testament is always going to help us interpret the Old Testament. So Jesus' brother, James, writes a book. In James chapter 5, verse 16, here's verse 11. Here's what he said. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevere. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about, the double blessing, the 140 years. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He's saying, Job is not just a story about suffering. Job is a story about enduring, staying under the weight of it, persevering, tenacious faith in the midst of suffering. And this is such an important picture because we so often have a picture that's phony, it's plastic, it's airbrushed, it's full of masks, and it doesn't pass the smell test to a watching world. And what ends up happening when you don't have the true picture of what persevering faith looks like, we beat ourselves up. God's punishing me. We beat others up. Oh, man, what did that guy do? And we're out of position to receive, to extend God's grace, and show a watching world. Though God take it all away. He still is worthy to be praised. So when God takes away, now what? Job says, God says, persevere in faith. So we need to understand what does that look like? He's persevering in faith when he's just ripping his clothes and shaving his head and, and there's the gut-wrenching sobs. He's he's persevering in faith when through a veil of tears he bows before God and, and praises and worships his name that though his circumstances have changed God has not he's persevering in faith when he goes through this all-star wrestling match with God and we better catch up with it we have to catch up with it as we find ourselves experiencing losses. At the end of the book, God finally speaks. Job gets what he asked for, an audience with God, and God speaks through the storm, demonstrating his power. The whirlwind, chapter 38, all the way to 41. And out of the storm, he gives him a virtual kind of tour of the universe. And with it, a booklet of 75 plus questions. The first question is, by the way, since you're so full of questions, you're so full of opinions of what is right and wrong in the world, where were you? Chapter 38, verse 4, when I laid the foundation of the world, where were you? And he goes and he gives this tour of the constellations and all the way down to these great, powerful animals, the Leviathan and the Behemoth. And at the end of the day, Job says this, I'm unworthy, chapter 40, verse 4. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I'm going to say no more. I've got nothing to say. I understand I'm not God. I, I, I can't even answer some fundamental basic questions of how this world is ordered, let alone try to understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. I try to make heads and tails out of human suffering and tragedy. So at the end of the, the, the whole conversation in chapter 42, verse 5, here's what he says, Job. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. As he compares himself with the greatness and holiness of God Almighty, I despise myself and I repent. Not of things that brought on this suffering, but some of the things that he thought of about God in the midst of the suffering. I repent in dust and ashes. So, wow, from worship to repentance and everything in between, persevering in faith. 
So guys, we can't forget this. That one of the fundamental things that God is helping us understand is it would be the wrong conclusion to always say this. I'm going through loss right now. I'm experiencing hardship. COVID has brought about this or that in my life, and it stinks. But the reason I got it and my friend didn't is because I'm being punished. Don't do that. That doesn't mean we don't face consequences for sin. That doesn't mean that God doesn't lovingly bring hard things into our life to polish us. But we know the storyline of the Bible is that God experienced the loss. He had his son taken away. Christ had his life taken away. And he had his dignity and his glory taken away. Not just when he took on humanity and our flesh, but when he hung naked on a cross, the everlasting son of God as an expression of God's love for us. He loves us. And so righteous Job suffers, and we can suffer, though we have done nothing wrong. And so there's struggle that requires humble honesty. There's going to be wrestling. And so this is how we take this home right now. Catch up with your losses. Acknowledge them. For some of us, it's so easy. We just lost a loved one. We weren't even there in their last hours to hold their hand. We don't even know when we'll have a family celebration. I lost my job. The income. It's obvious. For others of us, we're just kind of catching up to it. Acknowledge the loss. Name them. Voice your pain. Bring the pain and all the hurt and all the emotion. Bring it to God in worship and with humility and honesty. Bring God all your questions. He's big enough for that. God does not chide Job in the story. He chides his three friends and says, you guys, Job is going to make a sacrifice for you like he used to do for his kids so that you guys get right with me because you don't understand who I am. You think I'm a capricious, petty God. I'm not that kind of a God. And your worldview has too small. It's too small. And so may we, like Job, with all the messiness of Job, persevere in faith in the midst of our loss. God help us. Let's pray. So God, there's those who are listening right now who are going through so much loss and suffering and with that bitterness. Your word is clear. You are close to the brokenhearted. You can bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus, you say in your word, come unto me, all you who are weary and worn out. And so we pray that they would find your comfort and your mercy and your peace. Lord, we pray that in the midst of great losses, people would find you as their merciful Savior, who's not unfamiliar with loss, who's not unfamiliar with injustice and violence and all the cruelty that this world can bring. May they find you and may those of us who know you grow to find you in even greater ways to love you more and to be about your purposes. Lord, help us not to be lost in the midst of this pandemic, but to remember we're your children, that you've given us a mission to go and make disciples. And so by the way that we live, even in the midst of loss and suffering and hardship right now, may they see that you are worthy above all things, even in the midst of our losses. Help us to be real before you and our neighbors as we seek to point others to you. So we bless you, God, and we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for joining us. It's been great to look into a glimpse of the life of Job and his now what moment and how we can interact with that in our own lives. So I would encourage you to wrestle with some of the things that we've learned today as we've listened, as we've sung together. And uh, wherever we go for the rest of our week, whatever we do, the conversations that we have, may we be glorifying to God and we may, may we become more devoted followers of Christ this week. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to invite someone by just sharing this link and encouraging them to watch it. We'll see you soon.